I forgot what day of the week it was because it's COVID. <laughs> um, you know, I know, man. From the lie. it's it's, it's it, the 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 struggle is real. It's, it's really real. <laughs> Sounds good, inshallah. Uh, whenever you're ready, the floor is yours. Inshallah. Bismillah. Alhamdulillah. As-salatu wassalam ala Rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. First and foremost, I uh, just want to thank everyone for inviting me here tonight. Um, it's a great honor for me to be a part of this uh, really awesome initiative that you guys have actually put together. And I, you know, I, I think a lot of times we see so many, and, and I don't know how many of y'all, and you can chime in, you know, by, I, I know Zoom has really cool features, but like, you know, you can raise your hand and like wave and all that weird stuff. Um, but how many of y'all are really burnt out by the amount of online content that's out right now? right? Like live streams and videos and this and that and all that stuff. Um, it, it's sometimes very overwhelming, right? Um, so in, in my attempt to almost make that, that, that experience sweet, I actually wanted to keep my session really short and hopefully, inshallah, do some Q&A with you guys and do some kind of interactive uh, conversations uh, with y'all, inshallah, tonight. So, you know, I was given the topic of the value of time, right? Or how to use time wisely. Um, this is something that, by the way, so many scholars, so many speakers have given lectures on um, before, you know, tonight, right? Um, I wanted to actually just kind of tell a quick story. And this is really interesting, I think. And then this has always kind of helped me understand the concept of time. And it actually, I don't know how many of y'all are familiar with a person by the name of Imam Razi. Imam Razi is actually a very famous scholar of tafsir. Like he has one of the most advanced books of tafsir that exists today, right? Like his tafsir book, which is Arabic, obviously, is an extremely hard book to read for people who are kind of like even average in Arabic because his language is so extensive. And so y'all know like when a person like that, of that intellectual capability or capacity, you know, what, when they begin to understand something and they tell a story about how they got to learn a concept, it must be a really, really deep concept. So Imam Razi was actually doing a tafsir of Surah Al-Asr. Okay, and how many of y'all know Surah Al-Asr or are aware of Surah Al-Asr, right? Well, Asr, you know, it's, it's like a super short surah. Most of us kind of like speed demon through that thing during Maghrib Salah. We're like, well, Asr, and you're like, what a dolly. And you're like, wait a second, I connected two surahs together. Um, so, well, Asr, in the insan, right, is a very short surah. Very, very short surah. But the interesting thing about short surahs is that sometimes they have the most heavy language, right? It's kind of like the, the analogy of like, if you're really passionate about a subject and your teacher, for example, right? You're really passionate about the NBA, right? You're really passionate about basketball. And you've been like studying the bubble for the past like five months, right? I remember I read an article the other day about how like the shooters, like the shooters in the bubble are like way more accurate nowadays than they were in like normal arenas back in the day before COVID. It's not funny how I say back in the day before COVID. It's like pre-World War IV. Um, so like, you know, there, there, there's actually studies and analytics going on about how like people like Steph Curry and like Danny Green and all these like sharpshooters in the NBA are even more accurate with their shots in the bubble because their depth perception is like really, really, you know, it, it's, it's much more um, visible to them versus being in like an arena with 20,000 people. So it's almost like playing like pick up ball and like, like a public community, like community center or something like that, right? And so if I had to tell somebody that like, if you're really interested in something, right? You're really interested in like basketball or like you're interested in the NBA. And I told you that you had to summarize the NBA in three sentences. Like, what is basketball? Like, what, did it, what does it mean to you? A person who's really passionate about it would be like, man, three sentences. Like how on earth am I supposed to summarize this thing in three sentences? It's impossible, right? But in Surah Al-Asr, right? A surah that is talking about time talking about people who believe people who do good and the, and the virtues of patience and the virtues of, of, uh, of, of truth. It's very difficult to actually summarize it in three verses. So Imam Razi had a hard time understanding the surah and the value of it. Okay. So he was saying one time when he actually understood the value of time, he says, you know, in his commentary, he said before the, the age of like refrigerators, before the age of like electronics or whatever, you know, like modern day, um, types of preserving food, the preservation of food. People used to, what they used to do back in the day is that they used to, used to have people in cold climates climb to the tops of the mount, these mountains and they used to carve out like blocks of ice and bring it back down to like the marketplace and they used to sell it there, okay? Um, this involves a lot of different things, right? A person going up to the tops of the mountain, doing the hard manual labor of chopping down, putting out blocks of ice and bringing it back down onto like the, 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 the village where people used to live. 
And obviously, you know, for these people, time is money, right? Because ice, that's the way that people used to preserve food. But it always depended upon the how fast the person who was selling the ice got it out. And so Imam Razi, he says that he remembers that he was walking in the marketplace one day. And the marketplace in Arabic is called the souk, right? He was walking in the souk or the bazaar, you can call it. And he walked past. And by the way, like sellers of items or merchants used to have really, really awesome like lingo to pick up people's like, you know, interest in their items and their or in their merchandise. Nowadays, it's kind of like it, it's gone. It's like 15 minutes to save on car insurance, right? Geico, blah, 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 whatever. Right. But people back in the day had very, very interesting ways of uh, of, of drawing customers in to their to their to their business. And so Imam Razi, he says he was walking by the marketplace one day. And he heard something that was very interesting. He heard something very interesting by one of these people that used to be known to sell ice. That was his business, to sell ice. He said that one of these people, one of these men who was selling ice, he said in Arabic, but I'll say it in English. He says, oh, people. He's talking to like, you know, nas, right? Yeah, you have nas. Oh, people, have mercy on one whose capital is melting away. Okay. He said, have mercy on one whose capital is literally melting away. And this is a, kind of like a like a, an appeal to to get people to come and buy his 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 items, his merchandise, because if you don't buy it in time, you literally his capital and capital can be defined in multiple ways. But his capital was, you know, his his ability to sell this ice and able to in, in, in means of, you know, putting food on the table for his family in order to for his kids to get an education in order for his family to have food at night that was his that was the money that he was making so he was saying oh people have mercy on me have rahma have mercy on me a person who's selling ice before my capital begins to melt away because what you see is ice right what you see is ice for you to purchase and you know preserve your food and whatever you want to keep fresh but for me what's melting away is my kids education What's melting away is my family's food. What's melting away is literally my time, right? My, 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 what I have on this earth. And Imam Razi, he said, that was the day I really found out the meaning of something that was melting away. Okay. And so, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the Quran, he says this in very, very beautiful ways. Imam Ghazali also, he, he comments on this, right? There was a very beautiful poem. Uh, where a scholar, he said that, you know, your life comprises of a few breaths, right? Your life itself, right? It comprises of a few breaths that cannot be uh, counted, right? Your breaths cannot be counted. When one of them is sent out, a part of your life has diminished, okay? But that's how deep life and time really is, right? Each breath that you exhale, it's like a piece of your life is leaving. you. You're never going to be able to capture that breath and, and take it back. Although some of y'all might be like saying like, yeah, well, when you wear masks, you actually can't, right? Because you're breathing out what, you, what you're breathing and what you actually put out. But, you know, th this is a really profound kind of, you know, idea. And Allah comments on this in the Quran. He says, Wala asr, right? He's swearing by time. Wala asr innal insana la fi khusr. And I don't know how many of y'all really understand the translation of innal insana la fi khusr, right? The word khusr is really interesting. Khusr, right? Uh, in Arabic, there's another part of the Quran where this word is used. There are several parts of the Quran where this word is used, but in the dua that Prophet Adam made, you know, when he got kicked out of paradise by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for making a mistake, he says to Allah, he says, Rabbana zalamna anfusana wa illam tawfilana wa tarhamna lana kunana min al-fasibin. Okay. He says, Ya Allah, I'm the one, or we we wronged ourselves, you know, wa illam tawfilana wa tarhamna, if you don't forgive me, if you don't have mercy on us, lana kunana min al-fasibin. We will be of the ones who are at a loss, right? We are losers, he calls himself. So the word khasirin comes from the word khusr. The word khusr doesn't mean just a loss. You know, a lot of us take L's during the day, right? Like, for example, you go and, like, you, you, you try to, like, watch something that's expired, right? Or you try to buy something at the store that's not being sold anymore. It's out of stock, right? Like, you can say that you took an L that day because, like, you lost out on something. Khusr is not, like, your average taking a loss, okay? Khusr is not that. Khusr, you know... The scholars of Arabic, they actually describe the word khusr as an extremely depressing loss. A loss that can put somebody into depression, right? That like when you are immersed into this idea called khusr, it's almost a feeling of hopelessness. Like you don't feel like you can climb out of it. Y'all ever seen The Dark Knight Rises? Right? 
Christian Bale, best Batman to ever exist. Mashallah, tabarakallah, may Allah guide him to Islam and turn his name to Muslim Bale instead of Christian Bale. Um, you know, it, when he was climbing out of that pit, right? I always remember this. And I always think about this as like an analogy. When he was climbing out of that pit, like it was something that was always, you know, talked about that like you can't climb out of there. It's hopeless, right? And the villain who's torturing, you know, Christian Bale, right? Or Bruce Wayne in that entire movie, you know, he says that I don't need to torture your body because I don't need to torture your body. The, the real torture is the torture of the soul, right? Because the soul is something that can be tortured much further and much more extensively than the body can ever be tortured, right? And he says, I'm not going to torture your body. I'm going to leave you in this pit because this pit represents hopelessness. But you see like a little bit of hope in the, in the, in the, in the escape route, right? Like there's a little bit of light coming from the top of the, the, the pit. And people have gone crazy hoping all their lives, right? And so when I want you guys to think about Husser, I want you to think about that analogy. Husser is a, is, is a deep, depressing loss, right? And, you know, the scholars of Tafsir, they actually say modern day scholars of Tafsir, they say that, you know, the loss of time is something that strikes every human being. The loss of time is something that strikes every human being. How many of y'all, how many of y'all, would have you know today believed that we're already in like the sixth month of quarantine it's august right and i actually wallahi i still remember i still remember the week that dallas went into quarantine because of the coronavirus i remember roots we threw a retreat for for, for our youth uh during spring break i literally remember the dates march 12th to the 15th i remember those dates like i'll never forget those dates because while we were gone right it's almost like a black mirror episode you leave and then you come back and the world's changed right and I remember when we came back on March 15th, or that was a Friday, it was Jummah on a Friday. And we hosted Jummah that day uh, at the retreat. And, you know, we had cut ourselves off from our phone, social media, whatnot, because we wanted to reconnect with Allah and kind of disconnect with social media. And parents started to email me on Friday, on the day that, you know, the attendees were supposed to leave. And they said, you know, are our kids still going to be doing Jummah? Like, should we, should we even come pick them up? Because we may have been exposed. And I was like, man, exposed to what? Like, this is like a weird episode of The Walking Dead. Like, were you exposed to like something that we're not exposed to? And they're like, no, no, no. Did you not hear? Like, the, the coronavirus is like for real, for real now. Like, it's actually like, it's big time now. And subhanAllah, the day we left the retreat on Friday, I remember the day after, which was March 16th, Saturday, everything shut down. Everything shut down. Restaurants, stores, you know, um, movie theaters, whatever you want to call it, places that people normally used to frequent, everything shut down. But now we're in the sixth month of it. SubhanAllah, half a year has passed by, y'all. Half a year has passed by. Can you believe it? We only have like four to five months left of 2020. Y'all are like sitting here like, man, 2020? Man, I can't wait till this like Jahiliya year is over, right? Like, Man, I thought I, I really, for real thought like one day that the jealousy was going to pop up at my door and say like, you know, like this is what the year 2020 has been like for people. It's been rough. But subhanAllah, six months have already passed by, right? But in Surah Al-Asr, Allah kind of mentioned something. And I want to I I end my, my session. I want to end my kind of my, my, my talking portion with this one. We'll start Q&A and inshallah after this. After he says, Inna l-insan lafi khusr, he gives like this disposition to all of mankind that they're going to be ultimately this loss of time. Everyone's going to be a lot of loss of time. Everyone. It doesn't matter who you are. Young, old, man, woman, you know, young, you know, teenager, adult, uncle, auntie, whoever you are. Everyone's at a loss of time. There's no exception to that rule. A kid before they blink their eye will realize that they're 17. A 17-year-old with the blink of an eye will realize that they're 25. A 25-year-old with the blink of an eye will realize that they're parents. Parents with the blink of an eye will realize that they're grandparents. And everyone is subjugated to this, this, this disposition. But then he says one thing. He says, illa. You know, in Arabic, when you hear the word illa, your ears should perk up. In the Quran, when you hear the word illa, your ears should actually perk up. Because illa in Arabic means what, y'all? Anybody? You can message on the chat box. What does the word illa mean in Arabic? Anyone know? It's very simple. Accept. Very good. Very good. It means accept. So when something you say, blah, 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 illa, you're giving an exception to the rule. Okay. So Allah just laid out the status of everyone. Human beings are at a loss of time. Illa, except. And when the believer hears the word illa in this surah, they should be like, whoa, 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 wait, what? So we're not all doomed? Like, what, what's the exception, ya Allah? I want to be the exception. 
I want to be the exception to that rule that everyone's at a loss of time. What is the exception? Illa alladina amanu. Except those who truly believe. Those who truly believe in Allah. Y'all know people, and this is the reality of the sad fact that of people who don't really hope in Allah. The people who don't believe in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala are the true people who are at a loss of time. Because when you don't believe in an afterlife, what do you think your life actually is? Hada, right? Like this in front of you. This is it. When you die, you're done. There's nothing else to your life after this. Those are the people who don't believe in Allah. That you live your life to age 15, 20, 30, 40. I mean, how many of y'all, honestly, I thought about this seriously, and this is like the 2020 vibes that we're kind of giving off here. How many of all, how many of us, honestly, when this year started in January 26, 2020, how many of y'all would have ever thought that Kobe Bryant would have thought that he was going to die at this age? How many of y'all would have ever thought that Kobe Bryant would have thought, or his wife, his wife would have said, yeah, my daughter Gianna is only going to live to 13 or 14. Nobody, man. Nobody thinks like that. But the people who believe in Allah know that this life isn't all. Because those of you who believe, you know that your time is not only on this life. Your time continues on in the hereafter. Your time in this life is limited. It's a limited amount of test that you're given. And And those of you who back up your deeds or back up your, your faith by doing good deeds. And this is what separates Muslims from everyone else. You don't believe as long as you accept Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as your Lord and your, your Rabb that you're saved. You have to follow up your faith by amil salihat. You have to do good things in life, man. You can't just sit back and be like, yeah, alhamdulillah, Allah says to pray five times a day. And, you know, I heard there's this thing called fasting and there's this thing called sadaqah and this thing called, you know, shahada. As long as I say, la ilaha illallah, Muhammad sallallahu I'm good. No, man, that doesn't cut it. That doesn't cut it. You can't just be like, I accept this as my Lord and Savior and I'm good, right? Islam requires us to say, I accept Allah as my Lord and I accept the Prophet ﷺ as the final messenger of Allah. And at the same time, what I'm going to do to back up that faith is I'm going to submit to Allah and obey the tradition of the messenger of Allah, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Those are the two exceptions. إِلَّا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَةِ Right? And then, on top of that, are the people who advise other people. Okay? They advise other people. The people who advise other people to the truth. So not only are you told to believe, but you're told to act upon your belief. And and you're supposed to advise other people about good things. Y'all ever heard the phrase live and let live? In Islam, we don't believe that, yo. I'm just straight up going to tell you right now. I'm just going to tell you right now. You know, these people that are, mashallah, you know, we live in 2020. Live and let live, brother. What's wrong with you, right? Like, relax. It's okay, right? I'm Muslim. They hate Islam. Live and let live, right? Like, no, 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 no. Can you imagine if the prophet live and let live? Like, for real. He would have been like, Alhamdulillah, Rabbil I'm going to stay in the city of Mecca and just do my five salah. And then I'll let, you know, I'll let Abu Jahl live and let live. <laughs> Man, Islam would have been nothing. I'm not telling you, like, go out under the streets and, like, slap bottles of alcohol out of people's, people's hands. But in Islam, you don't live and let live, man. What you do is you believe what you believe and you try to enjoin other people in the truth. And in a good way. Is a very beautiful kind of pairing that you enjoin people to the truth in a very patient way. A very patient way. You're patient with people. That was the example of the Prophet wasallam. Is that when he advised people to the truth, he did it in a very, very patient way. Right? Very, very beautiful way. And so when Allah talks about Asr, right, the loss of time, how to kind of, you know, handle the idea of time. Yeah, the disposition is honestly that, you know, uh, uh, that, that, that the people are generally at a loss of time, but there's always hope. There's always hope for people. We oftentimes kind of say 
that, you know, it's hopeless, right? We're all at a loss of time. Everyone's at a loss of time. But there are people who appreciate time as well. There are people who appreciate time. It's all about mastering your idea of how you handle your own time. Okay. And so I wanted to actually kind of go through a couple of questions that were asked. And I want to see if anybody else has any questions that they want to ask after this, because I wanted, like I said, I want to keep my session kind of short and I wanted to make sure that, you know, we do a little bit of Q and a and a little bit of interactive kind of conversation at the end. So one of the questions I want to ask, and this is something that I want to kind of share with you guys is somebody said with quarantine, I have a lot of free time, but can't get myself to be productive. What are some ways I can increase my productivity with the time that I have during quarantine? This is an interesting, interesting, interesting question. How many of y'all feel, and you can raise your hand on, on Zoom, how many of you guys feel that you are literally like looking for things to do right now in quarantine? Like you're like, man, like there are moments in my day that are like gaping holes. Like I don't know what to do with those moments in my day. It's true. It's very true. And I know some of us are kind of like ashamed to say it because we're like, oh, you know, no, brother, man, ne you know, Netflix, Netflix so not after each salah is a good thing, you know, you know like who, who's to judge, right? Like it's, it's tough. It's very tough. It's very, very tough. One of the advices that I will give everybody right here is find your niche, find a purpose. Okay. Find a purpose. People who live very purposeless lives find it very difficult to handle the concept of time. People who don't feel like they have a purpose will always find it difficult to find things to fill their time. You know why the Prophet wasallam was such a busy person? It's because he never ever had a lot, lack of purpose in his life. Everything that he did had purpose in it. You know? If you could separate the life of the Prophet ﷺ to different roles, you could easily categorically kind of lay it out. He was a prophet of Allah. He was a community member. He was a, an educator. He was an imam. He was a friend. He was a companion. He was a husband. He was a father. You know, he was a neighbor. He had so many things in his life to fulfill. So he didn't have time to just lazy around, right? Not saying that it's haram to find time to be, you know, le like, you know, have leisure, or have moments of kind of like relaxation. But how many of y'all would agree with me that having too much time for leisure can kind of sometimes make you go crazy as a person? Then you find yourself like scrolling on TikTok and like, mashallah, like you miss like Maghrib and Isha Salah. And you're like, well, I'm sort of like, you know, chef here. So I, I heard you can combine different things here, right? Like, <laughs> so like, you know, it, it, it's very difficult to wrap your head around that, right? It's very difficult to wrap your head around that. So the number one piece of advice that I will, I will share with everybody is find your purpose, find your purpose. And this will be macro and micro levels. Macro, what is your purpose in life? What are your roles in life? Most of us now, mashallah, you guys are young folks. You guys are like, you know, in school, high school, college, whatever you want to call it. Your role as a student, your role as a son, your role as a daughter, for those of you who are watching on YouTube, you know, your role as a, as, as a, as a brother, as a cousin, as a neighbor. You have roles to fulfill. Ask yourself, are you doing diligence to the roles that you have in your life? Are you doing diligence to the roles that you have in your life? Are you being the best son that you can be? Are you being the best brother that you can be? And you can find time for those things in your life by fulfilling that purpose. Okay, that's number one. The second question I want to I hit up before I open it up to everyone else's questions is, is procrastination a sin in Islam? What are some ways I can reduce and eliminate procrastination? That's a great question. Is procrastination a sin in Islam? Very interesting question, right? Very interesting question. In a day and age where we kind of throw out the haram word for everything, right? We're like, ah, oh, this is haram. I'm pretty sure like this is haram too, right? Procrastination in and of itself is a habit that can turn bad very quickly. It can turn bad very, very quickly, okay? In Islam, things don't always naturally have the disposition of being halal or haram until it's used for a certain thing. For example, is fire halal or haram? Anyone? Fire, right? Like, no. Like, is it haram or halal? Most Muslims are like, wallahi, is halal. In fact, it's actually beautiful. It can be used to make biryani and nihari and kebabs, right? Like, fire can be haram or halal. Used to feed your neighbors, it's a very beautiful thing. 
used to harm people, it can be very sinful, right? So Islam has a very, very beautiful understanding of, of the way you use certain things. Procrastination usually errs towards the side of being a little bit, a little bit risky because procrastination, number one, forces somebody to delay their priorities, right? To delay their priorities. You know, this is something, by the way, as a brother, I will tell you guys, as an older brother right here, right now, I'll tell you guys. When you get older, when you get older, when you start to like adult in life, and you know, I got married about four years ago, right? I was got married four years ago at this point, 2016. Um, I was in a much different stage of my life than I am now. And in that stage of my life, you know, when I got married, I was basically finishing up college. Alhamdulillah, I had parents who believed in like nikah and stuff like that. So like, alhamdulillah, I was saved. <laughs> um, but at that stage of my life, I was a very different person, right? I was in college. I used to procrastinate things so I could kind of like get leisure, you know, early. But you know what's really interesting? And this is something that is very, very, and I learned this from my mentors and my teachers, is that the days that you work hard, you sleep real good. Y'all agree with me here? The days you work hard, you sleep real good, okay? Like the days you actually get things done, those days you, mashallah, deserve it. You deserve it. When you hit the bed at night, you feel good about yourself. How many of y'all feel very restless in the days where you feel really unproductive and you, you get in bed and you're like, I feel really uncomfortable right now. Like I, you have trouble sleeping. How many of us have trouble sleeping in days where you don't do anything? Those are the nights that you actually stay up and like, go through your Instagram feed for like an hour or you watch like 40,000 TikTok videos. You're literally doing tahajjud while you're watching TikTok. Like it's like, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's a very difficult thing, right? So what I would say about that to answer that question is be able to, to understand, to be a visionary, be a visionary, understand the consequences of your actions. The days you are productive, you'll find that your sleep is mashallah. Your sleep is real good. Your leisure is real good. You know the, the vacations I enjoy the most? And this is why most imams actually take their vacations after Ramadan. Most imams take their vacations after Ramadan. Why? Because Ramadan, man, is a spiritual grind. It's a spiritual grind. You are, you are reading Quran. You are engaging in salah. You are fasting every day. You're staying up at night praying and, and reading Quran and doing dhikr of Allah. Right? And then finally after Eid is when you deserve to relax. Man, if you try to relax after Ramadan where you didn't do much, it's very hard to relax. So my advice to that is procrastination is sinful. Is it, is it sinful? Maybe. Maybe it's sinful. It depends on the person. How far do you procrastinate? Procrastination can be five minutes or it could be like five days, right? So ask yourself, how much do you procrastinate? Always make sure that you get your priorities straight in your days and you'll be able to relax in a very beautiful way. Okay. Uh, Moaz, do we have any questions? Uh, yes, we have some questions, inshallah. Okay. Uh, so first of all, I want to say thank you. Those were amazing questions and even better answers. And I think that quarantine is a really good teacher in teaching us that, you know, time moves exponentially faster the older that you get, right? And mm -hmm. so coming back to the, de the depressing loss that you talked about describing the word khusr, um, one of the questions we have is, I know I shouldn't think like have fun now and focus on Islam later, but how can I get myself to start focusing on and incorporating Islamic values and salah into my daily life? Mm, how can I incorporate Islamic values and salah into my daily life? Very, very good question. My answer to that is going to be a little deeper than what the surface level would actually kind of warrant. A person's dedication to their Islamic values and their salah has to do a lot with your personal relationship with Allah. It has a lot to do with your personal relationship with Allah. Okay. How many of you guys, honestly, would go above and beyond for a friend that you have a really deep relationship with, even if it inconveniences you? Right. Like a friend hits you up at like 1130 p.m. at night and you're like done for the night. You called it a day. You know, you're tired. You've done a lot of stuff that day. But a friend hits you up and they say, hey, man, I really need you right now. I need to talk to you. I have something going on in my life that's really difficult and I need your I need your advice. I need your attention. If you really love that friend and you're dedicated to that friend and you have personal relationship with that friend and you have memories with that friend, it doesn't matter what time of the day it is. You drop whatever you're doing and you go run to that friend of yours. 
Islam, Salah, any sort of act that you do for the sake of Allah, it needs a personal relationship. You know, a really big problem we have in our communities is that we expect everybody to be at a very high level of Iman when people have a very big disconnect with their relationship with Allah. You know, we yell at kids, why don't you read Quran? Why don't you pray on time? Man, this kid doesn't care about prayer. He doesn't care about prayer. Like, how, how can you expect somebody to drop whatever they're doing and do Salah when they have no personal relationship with Salah? Do they understand what Salah is? Do they understand what Salah can do for you? Do you understand what the benefits of praying on time is? No. Then how can you expect somebody to have that relationship? Right? We have to make Islam very personal for us. Extremely personal for us. Now, how many of us, by the way, and now this is a very, it's not going to kind of like a funny question, but how many of us have a very specific prayer, prayer area in our house? Right. And I actually did this exercise with, uh, with some of my, my youth in, at Roots. We do like a Zoom session every Friday. And one of the activities was show us the place where you pray. What's your, where's your, where's your prayer spot? Right. And some of them were like, oh, I didn't know I needed a prayer spot. The earth is a prayer spot, right, brother? Right. Like, um, but yes, although that's true, that Allah has made the entire earth, the earth, the world, a place of prayer for us. Where do you go to connect with Allah? This is a prophetic tradition, by the way. Why was the prophet so attached to Allah? Because he used to go to Ghar Hira. He used to get away from people. When life was too much, he used to go up to this place where his grandfather, Abdul Muttalib, used to go, where he could have a vantage point of the Kaaba, and he used to meditate, man. He used to reconnect with Allah while he disconnected with the people. And that was his time with Allah. Have you ever thought, why was the prophet so close to Allah? Because his time with Allah was very personal. It wasn't with everybody else. It wasn't a time where like you're distracted by a billion things and you're thinking about where to hang out after what's the post news, right? Like, what do I do? What do I watch after this Isha prayer is over? No, 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 man. His time with Allah was his time with Allah. That was it. I only get five of these a day. I got to make these things count, right? So my answer to that is if you want to really grow a, a, a love for Salah and instill an Islamic kind of value in your life, you got to make it personal for yourself. You got to make it personal for yourself and start with the small things. Make a salat corner in your room. Make a salat corner in your house somewhere. You know what my salat corner is in my house? Actually, it's outside on my patio. That's where I do my, that's where I do my margrip salat whenever I can. I do it outside. I get away from like, you know, the TV inside the house. I get away from, you know, the kitchen where I get distracted by cooking and making steak and stuff like that. I go outside the patio. We have some plants out there. I reconnect with nature. And I do my maghrib salah there. It's a way that I just get away with things, I get away with other people, get away from other people, and I engage with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Make it very personal for yourself. Okay. Excellent. That was a great answer, Brother Safi. And so, you know, um, with all the distractions of the dunya, you know, it's it can be hard to really like clamp down and focus on your deen. So one of the questions that we have is I have nothing else to do but chill, watch Netflix and play video games. How am I supposed to use my time wisely if I have nothing else to do? How do I use time wisely if I have nothing else to do? <laughs> um, I don't think that, you know, I, I'm not going to sit here and give fatwas on like watching Netflix and like playing like PS4 and ordering the new PS5. Like, I'm not going to do that for you guys right now. Um, but what I will say is have moments of productivity throughout the day. Don't just make an entire day leisure. Okay. Don't make an entire day leisure. Find moments of productivity. You know, Islam is really interesting. Islam has a lot to do with appreciating small moments. Right. And I kind of posted about this actually a couple of days ago on my Instagram, where I went to my first Joma Salah in like over five months at the Valley Ranch Islamic Center. And I remember it was like 95 degree heat. Y'all, you know, I'm new to Dallas, Texas relatively. I moved here like a year and a half ago. Man, dude, like Dallas heat is like, you know, like you can cook like a steak medium rare. Like that, that's like intense Dallas heat during the daytime. All right. And, um, you know, I, I was out there 97, 98 degrees during the day. And I was thinking to myself, man, this is hot out here, right? But then I remember every like few minutes, there was like a little bit of a breeze that came through. A little bit of a breeze that came through. And when that breeze came through, wallahi, I forgot about the heat. I forgot about the heat. It felt so good at that moment. 
And I reflected that day after Juma and I said, this is how life really is. Life is a struggle, man. Life is a struggle. Allah says this in the Quran, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ Right? In Surah Al-Balad, Allah says that, لَقَدْ خَلَقْنَا الْإِنسَانَ فِي كَبَدْ Verily, we have created mankind fi kabat. Fi means immersed into, inside of. Fi kabat, the word kabat means hardship. Struggle, challenged, right? We have created mankind in a struggle. But what human beings have to do is learn to appreciate the moments that you find within those struggles. Appreciate it. Appreciate those moments where you find pieces, minutes, maybe like a half an hour of productivity, right? So number one, don't feel bad if you feel extremely unproductive during COVID. This is a challenge, dude. This is a challenge. How many of y'all felt much more productive pre-COVID? Like I had school, I could go to the masjid, I could go like be with people and kind of like be in good company. I could go do things for the sake of Allah. I could do things like to be in the sake, for the sake of being in, in, my, in, my, in, my, in my friends group, my brotherhood, whatever, whatever it is. Nowadays, man, like people are alone. You know, like the, the, the idea of like the lone sheep gets eaten by the wolf. That's very true right now. Shaitan is like hunting. It's like hunting season for Shaitan. You know, when, when Allah says, Allah says, uh, min al khannas, you know the word khannas in, in, in Surah uh, Al-Nas? It means the one who whispers and he continues to withdraw and come forward. Withdraw and come forward. It comes from the word khanasa, which means like the one who basically comes and goes, comes and goes, comes and goes. Shaitan right now is like he, full on. You know, y'all seen like the Lord of the Rings battle scenes, like charge. That, that's literally shaitan right now. He sees you at your weakest right now. You're alone. You're vulnerable. There's a lot of things that you could be doing that could be not so good for you. Shaitan is on full game mode right now. Dude. He's like LeBron in like the playoffs. Like he's full on right now. We have to be able to find bits and pieces and moments in our day where we are able to find productivity. Don't, don't make your, don't, don't make like Netflix and like video games haram for yourself, right? They're not inherently haram, but it does become a means of, of, of haram. If you abandon other things that you have in your life, like, like salah and dhikr and, 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 and dua, if you neglect Allah, then the things that you do to fill your time in lieu of those rights that Allah has upon you, then those things that you fill your time with actually become haram upon you, Right. So we got to make sure that we appreciate those small bits and pieces during the day. Make a schedule for yourself. Make a schedule for yourself, right? Like in the morning, se separate your day out of the three parts. Morning, afternoon, evening. You got to do one productive thing in each third of the day. In the morning, I got to do one productive thing. In the afternoon, I got to do one productive thing. In the nighttime, I got to do one productive thing. And don't, all be, and don't make those things straight up spiritual, right? Because sometimes, you know, Imam Suhaib Web actually, actually says it. He says, Any, uh, anything can be a form of ibadah, a form of worship. Even if it's like cooking, fit, cooking dinner for your family at night, it's a form of worship, man. Make that your night. That make that your productivity for the night. I'm gonna make dinner for my family, right? So find these bits and pieces and schedule yourself throughout the day. That might, that's my answer to that, inshallah. You know, I really like what you said about that. You know, when when we're dealing with difficulty, it can be difficult to you know keep track of the bigger picture and keeping uh, track of the little dubs that we have can really help us keep to keep going basically mm. and the next question that we have is how can i use the idea of goals and a vision to help increase my productivity how can i use the idea of goals and vision to increase my productivity um i would actually say that your goals will change throughout your life right your goals will change throughout your life for example the goal that you have right now as a 17 year old as an 18 year old will change when you're 21 yes the goals that you have when you're 15 will change when you're 18. Your goals will constantly change, right? Um, how to turn those goals and that vision kind of benefit your productivity is along the lines of, like I said before, being a visionary, being a visionary person in a day and age where we literally live for the now, unfortunately, like how many of y'all will testify to this? So many people live for the now right now. We don't see the consequences later, you know. Um, we don't see how our actions can actually warrant consequences 10 years down the line. When people post things on Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok, dude, it's on the cloud now. Like, it, it, it's everywhere. Even if you were a different person 10 years later, that thing is still out there about you, right? But the people who are really successful, Allah uses the word muflihun in the Quran to describe people who are successful. 
The people who are muflihun are the people who are visionaries. They don't only live in the now. They don't only live in the now. They have long-term goals. So the answer to that, you know, I would, I would answer that Moaz is, don't only have short-term goals. Have long-term goals, man. Where do you want to be in 10 years? You know, what do you want to be like in 15 years? I'm still trying to figure that out, by the way. I'm 27. And I'm trying to envision what life will be like in my 30s. You know, what kind of a lifestyle do I want when I'm 35? Because my life will be drastically different. My, my wife and I right now, we don't have kids yet. But what will my life be like when I have kids? It will be drastically different. Most of y'all are in high school or college right now. Have you ever thought, well, what's life going to be like when you have a family? You're like, oh, God. La ilaha illallah. Don't say such things, right? <laughs> like, but, you know, like, what's going to happen when you got your own family? You know, what happens when you have somebody in your life where you got to split time with, right? Trust me, y'all. Y'all going to find this real fun, man, when you get married. Subhanallah, dude. You know that time where you take to kind of be like, this is my time? Oof. That thing is split. That thing is split from now on. That thing is not only your time anymore, right? But you're like, okay, you know what? School, alhamdulillah, you know, seven to, seven to, four, seven to three, eight to four, whatever it is. Come home, take a little bit of a nap, right? Do a little bit of homework. And then, khalas, dude, 7.30 to midnight is me, right? <laughs> 7.30 to midnight is me. Not when you got somebody else that requires your attention now. Not when you got kids that require your attention, right? Today, this morning, I had a very good friend of mine, mashallah, Hafiz Faraz, Faraz Jilani. He's a, he's a radiologist here, um, you know, uh, in, 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 in downtown, but he works in Irving. He, he lives in Irving. And me and him, we, we play tennis together a lot because tennis, mashallah, everyone used to make fun of it, but now it's like the most like COVID-friendly sport of all time, right? And so me and Faraz, we, we were like, you know, we used to play tennis at night. And Hafiz Faraz, he was like, Hey, is there a way you can play after Fudger? And I was like, man, like, what? After Fudger, dude? After Fudger is like, go back to sleep mode, right? Like, he, like Fudger is like that break in the sleep mode, right? And he goes, no, 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 man. When you have kids, like, you gotta, you, you gotta, you gotta maximize on that time. So he goes, at nighttime is like when I gotta spend time with my kids, put them to bed. So during during the early morning Fudger time, they're usually asleep, so I can play for like two two and a half hours. I'm like, man, never thought of this in my life, right? But life changes, right? Life changes. So be a visionary. Be a person who sees into the future. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was a visionary. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam knew that he was going to have to go to Medina eventually. He knew it. He's like, this stuff in Mecca cannot go on forever. I have to leave and go to Medina eventually. Right? This is something that, 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 that's a prophetic example. This next question is pretty good one from what I can see. Uh, I can get down some slash most of my daily prayers, but I still miss out on my relationship with the Quran. How can I consistently implement reading slash understanding the Quran in my daily life without making it overwhelming? Mm. How can I make my reading and understanding of the Quran a part of my daily life without being overwhelmed by it? Very good question. Very, very good question. I think a big problem in our community is we live in a very comparative society. Y'all understand what I mean by that? We like to compare people a lot. You know, like Abdullah, mashallah, does like one juz every month, right? Abdullah also might be like speed demon Quran reciter, man. Like you might just be like, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. You know, like that, that, that level of reading. Now that's fine. So the first step, the first step, and this starts, the, this, is the, this is the first thing that you do before you continue on to establishing a routine with the Quran, is stop comparing yourself to other people. Stop comparing yourself to other people. I always say this, by the way, when it comes to Ramadan as well, you know, Ramadan, we all try to set our goals and we're like, oh, you know, like, you know, I see my friend, he's doing this and this and this and, um, and, 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 you know, he's reading this much and he's doing this much dua, he's staying up for the Hajj this many nights in Ramadan. Stop comparing yourself, man. Stop comparing yourself to other people. Do what you can do. If for you reading one, one ayah a day is, is impactful, then do it. You don't got to worry about reading like two pages a day. Read one ayah a day, man. Read one ayah a day. You know what I did today, actually? You know, like besides like teaching my class that I have on Sundays, I really went back and reflected over the ayah in the Quran. That was my Quran for the day. Not saying that like that's like how much I read every day. But like everyone's like, wow, dude, this, this ustad is like super fake, right? <laughs> um, no, no, no. But I went back and connected with that one ayah. 
Why? Because I really wanted to go back and reconnect with the word rub. What does it mean? Right? What does the word rub mean in my life? So number one, stop comparing yourself to other people. Number two is do what you can do in a day. Be realistic with your goals, right? We sometimes go on spiritual highs and spiritual lows. How many of y'all have been on spiritual highs before in your life? Spiritual highs. I'll, I'll, I'll raise my hand first and foremost. How many of you guys have been on spiritual lows? Raise your hand. I've been on spiritual lows in my life too, right? This is the nature of your heart, right? The word qalb in Arabic means to flip, right? Go, you know, turning one side to the other. This is why there's a dua, ya muqallib al qulub thabit qalbi ala dinik, right? No turner of hearts, make my heart firm upon the deen. Your heart will constantly change in how, you know, in, 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 in how devoted you are to your faith and sometimes how lazy you feel towards your faith. Make yourself a goal that is attainable for you in terms of your, your, your level of dedication to your faith, right? If your level today is like, you know, and sometimes when you're in a spiritual high, you're like, mashallah, you know, I can read Surah Al-Baqarah every month of my life. I swear to God, wallah al I can, right? And then, and then like the month of like September comes and you're like, bro, I'm like struggling reciting ikhlas during my salah, right? So like, you got to make yourself be very, you got to be realistic with yourself. Don't get overhyped, right? A Muslim is not a person who dives too deep or nor does he dive, dive into the shallow end either. He goes right into the middle. Ummatul wasata is what Allah calls us in the Quran. The ummah that's in the middle. Always be balanced with what you do. Now, this next question is in response to bringing up the point about Fajr earlier. So it's, how do I take advantage of the barakah of post-Fajr if I have school or work in the morning? How do I gain the barakah or reap the barakah, the blessings of uh, Fajr if I have school in the morning? It's a good question, actually. What I would say, what I would say is for Fajr Salah, if you cannot spend time, like actual quantitative time after your Salah in the morning, what you do is you really, really engage in your Fajr Sunnah prayer. Spend some time before. You know, there's actually something that Sayyidina Aisha, radiallahu anha, she narrated. She said that my husband, the Prophet ﷺ, he never neglected a few things. Four things he never neglected. Four things. This is actually an authentic hadith. She said that, number one, he never neglected the fast on the day of Ashura. Number two, he's never neglected the fast on the day of Arafah. Number three, he never, never used to fast any uh, less than three days a month. He used to always fast three days a month. That was something he was used to use in his tradition. And number four is he never neglected his extra prayers during the Fajr Salah. Those are the four things he never neglected in his life. So if you have time before Fajr Salah, take advantage of that. Even if it means like throw up like two raka'ah of like nawafil prayer, two extra raka'ah of voluntary prayer before you do your actual Fajr, uh, Fajr Salah that's fard, do two raka'ah of like voluntary Salah. If you don't have time to do it after, just do a little bit of like that grind, a little bit of that hustle before the Fajr Salah. Take advantage of that. Don't neglect what you can do before. There's always an option in Islam, man. Y'all ever, y'all ever wonder why Allah gives you like the day of Ashura, the day of Arafah, you know, the, 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 the days in Shawwal. Why does Allah give you so many options that have the same reward? Why does Allah give you Ashura and, and Arafah and, the, and, the, and the, sixth, the, the sixth that you can fast the month after Ramadan? Why? Because Allah knows that sometimes people are not able to do certain things, right? Like what if a woman is on her time of the month during the day of Ashura? And hopefully she'll be able to fast the day of Arafah. What if she can't fast the day of Arafah? What if a man is too sick to fast the day of Arafah? You have the six days after the month of Ramadan. There are multiple ways where Allah gives us opportunities to do things. If you can't spend time after Fajr, spend two minutes before Fajr, right? Always find ways. Always find, always find the ways you can maximize. So this will be the last question, inshallah. And it's living in America, I often feel pulled in two different directions between my deen and my dunya. How can I properly prioritize my deen while balancing the success of the dunya? Mm, how can I prioritize my deen while balancing the success in this dunya? Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana, right? I mean, there, there, there's a literal dua about it, okay? That don't think that this world is haram, right? This is why, by the way, you ask for the best in this life. Right, Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana. That's the first part of the du'a. Oh Allah, 
give me, you know, give me goodness in this dunya. You know, like give, give me, give, give me success in this dunya. Give me, give me, give me good things in this dunya. Right. And success in the hereafter. So first and foremost, don't think that one negates the other. Yeah. You know, Imam Malik, rahimahullah, right? Imam Malik, y'all ever heard of Imam Malik before? Malik bin Anas? He's one of the four, you know, one of the greatest, you know, scholars of Islamic law of all time. This is why the Maliki Madhab is named after him. Imam Malik, you know, used to live a very, very mashallah life. You know, <laughs> I, I, like to, I like to use that word very loosely because he, he used to dress extremely well. You know, Imam Malik, when people saw Imam Malik roll up, they're like, dude, that's Imam Malik right there. Like, man, man's had like a different fit for every class he taught. Okay, like he had a different turban on for every class that he taught. Um, and, 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 you know, what's really beautiful about that, though, Imam Malik at the same time was one of the most humble, down to earth people that used to focus on the Akhira as well. All right. So don't think that your Akhira is nullifying your dunya. Na- neither does your dunya nullify your Akhira. They, bor- they both work hand in hand. Just because you're a person who aims towards the akhirah does not mean that you cannot be benefiting from this dunya, right? One of my teachers said something beautiful, and this is how I'll answer this question. This is the end of uh, my, my answer. My teacher said, keep the dunya in your pocket and keep the akhirah in your heart. Keep the dunya in your pocket, keep the akhirah in your heart. Why? Because the dunya you use for whatever resources it can give you. Like for your phone. You know, you keep it in your pocket. You keep it in your pocket. Most of us are like, no, actually, I should keep it in my heart. Alhamdulillah. Right? Like, no, no, no. You keep your phone in your pocket, right? You keep your phone in your pocket because it has faculty. It has resources that you can use. But you don't live and die by your phone. What you keep in your heart is what stays with you even after you die. Everything else in this life will go away, right? Those are the things that you keep in your pocket. You know, you keep your phone in your pocket. You keep your money in your pocket. These things will leave you, man. But what you keep in your heart is the akhirah, your values, your morals, your deen, your faith, your iman, your ihsan. That's what you keep in your heart. Those are the things that live with you till you pass away and stay with you even in the afterlife. And they benefit you in the afterlife. So what I would say to balance out your deen and dunya is you use your dunya to whatever good that comes from this dunya, but always understand that if there comes a time, if there comes a time where Allah tests you, where your deen and your dunya are on kind of like a, like a pedestal where you got to choose one or the other, you got to make sure you choose your deen over your dunya every single time, man. You got to choose your deen over your dunya every single time because your dunya is very fickle. It has its uses, but that's it. Nothing more than that. Your akhira is what stays with you. Jazakallah khair, Brother Safi. So it looks like we're running kind of short on time. So would you like to do the honors of the closing dua, inshallah? Inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be people who are in his mercy and in his love. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless the organization of YM. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make every single program and event that YM facilitates a means of khair and a means of benefit for the people that participate in it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless all the organizers and their families and the attendees and their families. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow us to be people that with every session of reflection, every session of, of remembrance of Allah, that it's a means that we get closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala allow everything good that we said to be a form of heavy deeds on the scale of deeds that we have to present to Allah on the day of judgment. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala forgive us for any of our mistakes and our shortcomings, whether they be known or unknown, whether they be direct or indirect, whether they be secret or public. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wipe our sins clean. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept from all of us in the tradition of Prophet Ibrahim as he says, رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيرُ الْعَلِيمُ Jazakallah khair, brother Safi, and Jazakallah for everyone else for hopping on today. Uh, please uh, join us next week, next week inshallah, uh, on the episode of Spiritual Essentials. And that concludes our day. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.